All right, well, who'd like to start today? I've got, I've got like four cases I could show. I don't know. I see Brent on there. I don't know if he has any to show. I, I do have some this week. You want to start, Brent? Sure. All right. Okay. Um, let me make sure I have the right screen. Can you see the screen now? I see your database. Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I have the same issues. <laughs> I just. <laughs> can you see now? Yeah, we see your CT. Okay. Okay. So. This is a um, coronary CTA, and um, this is just a, a quick uh, reminder of why, you know, we're we're radiologists and we look at everything. Um, this is a patient who came in with uh, with acute onset um, chest pain and had some some right sided chest pain, and I was, um, you know, let's flip to the diastolic uh, phase here. Uh, reading the coronary CTA uh, CTA here, and um, you know, so far it looks. Looks pretty normal. Um, you know, looked at all the coronaries, couldn't see any any stenoses or really any any plaque here. Uh, there was no no calcium here. And let me just uh, show you that I don't have this zoomed up. This is the um, you know this is the entire field of view that we would get if we just looked at the coronary uh, portion of the examination. And I want you to kind of concentrate on the the uh, the right um, lower lung here. And you know, looking in this region. You know, we always look for um, other incidental findings. Clearly, PE is a, you know, cause of chest pain. We, we look for that on every study. But um, here, there's really nothing. So um, full field of view, though, uh, just a really good reminder of that. Let's look in that right lower lobe again. And just right, exactly right outside the field of view, uh, there's this acute pulmonary embolus uh, that you would never see if you didn't look at the full field of view. So um, there it is, and she was in fact having right side chest pain. And so it's just a good reminder, you know, always look at the field of view. Field of view. And in fact, I now I try to start with the full field of view instead of looking at the dedicated um, cardiac uh, portion of the, the, the coronary CTA. Um, I've been, you know, I, I've had this happen um, too many times um, <laughs> for that not to you know, pop up immediately on my on my uh, review. So, so just a good case of uh, full field of view showing a PE that would never have been seen in the um, in the limited field of view. So, and here's another um, just quick case. Uh, this was a um, middle aged uh, female who came in uh, with a little bit of chronic shortness of breath. Um, but, I'm not seeing anything yet. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Came in with uh, shortness of breath, and in um, the anterior segment of the upper lobe, you can see a, a nodule here. It's kind of a, a bilobed uh, nodule, a little bit of adjacent ground glass here, a little bit of a regular margin, and it's non calcified. Um, you can also just in wasn't really commented on in, in this particular CT, but in, in retrospect here, you can see just a few clusters of, of nodules here and there. Um, nothing too, nothing too dramatic, and and not a not a great deal of, of scarring or bronchiectasis anywhere. Um, but this nodule was considered to be, um, you know, concerning for malignancy, and you can see here that um, the nodule was biopsy. Um, you can see the. Um, that nodule is biopsied here, uh, percutaneously, and um, let me show you the follow-up here. Um, nothing was really done for this nodule, but it resolved um, uh, months months later, and this was about uh, nine or ten months later. And uh, this nodule had no malignant cells, but it did grow MAC. Yeah. So it's just a good demonstration of how infectious nodules, including MAC, uh, can be very uh, concerning on CT and, and picking up perhaps some of the other subtle findings here could be helpful in, in creating a, a differential that might have included infection um, rather than simply uh, malignancy. So this is a good case of kind of a focal um, 
nodule that was caused by, by Mac. So, all right, and here's a, um, another interesting one. This is uh, courtesy of um, a colleague of mine now, um, Nick uh, Goyle, and um, he uh, brought up this CT, and you can see that um, this is CTA. Yeah, we can't a, oh, sorry, I apologize. I, I really don't like this new no, CT meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so on the CT, um, you can see this extensive calcification of the aorta rising, you know, the ascending aorta involving the arch and, and descending. It's very, very robust, um, fun-like calcification. It's continuous, it's circumferential, and it goes all the way down uh, to the abdomen, and there are multiple aneurysms here as well. And if you go back up to the, um, to the arch vessels, um, there's severe stenosis of the um, carotid and um, the um, proximal subclavian here, and um, you know the vertebral as well. And so the, the let me show you the sagittal here. So so we we don't have you know confirmation on this, but the, the thought is that this is probably more likely to be an extensive um, vasculitis such as Takayasu um, rather than anything else uh, because of the very very robust nature of the calcification. Of course it involves the um, the type of, of vessels giving stenosis and aneurysms that you would you would expect so um, you know this is a very interesting case of presumably um, a vasculitis um, rather than an atherosclerotic disease causing this pattern of, of calcification any comments on, on on this one well you could consider I mean unlikely but you could consider syphilis too yeah yeah that's a that's an interesting Gives you that really bark-like calcification. Now, how old was this patient? In the uh, in the sixties. So probably giant cell then. So yeah, giant cell um, as well. Or are we thinking if it if it is a tachyosi, then it's a burned out. Um, yeah, because I mean. So yeah. Okay, and then um, I just have one other quick one that I thought was a um, interesting case, and I'll show you the. Um, the chest X-ray I looked at, and I was ready to call the uh, frontal. Oh, sorry. Let me show the screen. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, chest X-ray. So I was ready to call this um, chest X-ray normal. I'll let you take a look at this for a couple of uh, seconds here. Um, but then I looked at the lateral, and it made me reconsider the normal and the um, reconsider the frontal view. And here's the here's the lateral. And should we take a look at that for a second? I'll blow this up just a bit. And on the lateral, the thing is, that struck me was that, you know, there's this clear filling in here of the retrosternal clear space. And this, you know, what looks like it should be a large abnormality on the frontal. But looking back at the frontal, um, you know, even with windowing, you can't really see much going on in the, in the mediastinum here. Um, but look again um, in the soft tissues, and you can see that there's this massive asymmetry between the soft tissues on the left and the right, and there's filling in at the axilla. So, um, you know, luckily I had a um, prior um, P, uh, PET CT, and I think it's just interesting, an interesting case how the retrosternal clear space, um, in this case, is filled in by soft tissue um, in the axilla and the skin. So. I'll give the additional history now that um, this is a patient with metastatic uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin um, that uh, had metastatic spread from the neck. So it's just an awful case, but you can see um, this metastatic soft tissue and these, this nodal tissue and, um, and soft tissue here is projecting um, over the anterior mediastinum. So in retrospect, that was what was going on here, and that was, um, you know, presumably what's projecting here over the anterior mediastinum. So I just thought it was a good example of how, you know, it could easily, and in fact, at first I walked by this until I flipped to the lateral and, and, and had that. So I just thought that was an interesting case. Yeah, great. All right, well, thank you, Brent. That's it. All right, Travis, you want to go now? Sure. All right, you guys see a chest radiograph? <laughs> we do. Okay. Oh, wait, what happened? We Somebody do. take control from me? Uh, no. I'm showing your screen now. That's so weird. All right, let's try again. You see my screen now. Now we do. Okay. 
Uh, this kind of follows the last case that Brent just showed. It's a PHS radiograph here that you see, obviously. And, um, you know, sometimes external devices like pacemakers are, you know, skillfully placed to obscure underlying findings. On, the chest, on this PHS radiograph, I would call this completely normal. But when you look at the lateral view, notice what you see right in this area, that there looks like there's this band of consolidation. And it's right at the level of the aortic arch. And so you can see when the patient's arms are down, that there may be something going on right behind here. This is just a fun one. We already had the CT. This is a pre-op radiograph um, that you'll see that this is a big, looks like an adenocarcinoma. They haven't taken it out yet, but I'm presuming this is an adenocarcinoma. It just happens to be almost entirely obscured by her overlying pacemaker generator. And you can see on the scalp from the CT how obvious it is when her arms are up, moving the, the generator out of the way. So another, uh, another vote in favor of the lateral view here. Just another quick fun case. So let's see, next one. I'm going to show another quick radiograph case. This is a, a lady that came in from an outside hospital, and she's 26 weeks pregnant. She has this, she had this radiograph done in an outside hospital, and she apparently coded at this time. She came in septic, and you can see looks like she has some interstitial edema and some more discrete nodular opacities here. So while she was coding, they placed a line, and this was at the outside hospital, and obviously this line is not going in the right direction. It's pretty medial. This was an attempted IJ line that is now projecting medially and then projecting over her aorta. You know, on this, I would looks like it's more projecting over the descending aorta, but they uh, did a CT at the outside hospital before transferring her. So you'd think it'd be a carotid placement, uh, but you can see here is the, the internal jugular vein. The line goes through the internal jugular vein, not into the carotid, but actually directly into the right subclavian artery. So they got a pretty deep puncture there, and then it ends up, it's actually in the descending aorta, and it's almost down at the level of the valve. And of course, this, because it was such a deep arteriotomy that they had performed when they were placing this, that she had to undergo a, a mini sternotomy to repair her subclavian artery injury for this arterial line placement. So it's been a while since I've seen an arterial line, but this was, this was a good example, I thought. So those are the two radiograph cases. I'm going to show this one's a pretty interesting case. And um, let's see, I don't know if I remember the, I think all the radiographs are pretty similar. So this is a patient that um, is in his 50s, I believe, or maybe his 40s, but was admitted to an outside hospital with uh, meningitis and eventually found to have cryptococcal meningitis. And you can see on his radiograph that he has some volume loss on the right side, and it looks like He's got at least right lower lobe collapse. You, know, the, you can still see some of the right heart border, maybe a little bit of right middle lobe involvement as well. But um, you know, he had had a history of recurrent pneumonias on the right side, which also should be a clue. And you can see on the lateral here that he's got a spine sign. He's got obscuration of the hemidiaphragm. And you just have too much fullness in the subcarinal region. You've lost your, your intermediate stem line. So it certainly looks like there's probably an obstructing mass here. He, um, and you can see the timeline's a little off, but here's the one of the CTs, the one with contrast. And you can see that there's an endobronchial lesion in the bronchus intermedius right here, as well as just big necrotic looking, ugly looking, bright lower lobe, all of this stuff. And then you know, whether this is a combination of post-obstructive pneumonia and or atelectasis, but you know, I would have thought this would be a tumor. Like I told you, he had a history of cryptococcal meningitis. They went in, first did a biopsy, transbronchial, expecting to find a tumor, and all they got was cryptococcus. And then they eventually went and did a right lower lobectomy, and it was all cryptococcus as well. So it's more of like a, a mass-like presentation where I guess it was just in the cryptococcoma, or whatever you want to call it, was was invading into the bronchus and causing this post-obstructive pneumonia. So, have you guys seen something look like that before? I don't remember 
ever seen infection looking this much like a, a cancer. I've seen one case of cryptococcus in the airways, but it looked more like a tracheitis with multiple like ropey lesions, you know, like you might see with, mm -hmm. you know, DPA or inflammatory bowel disease, but not like something that looks like a, like a carcinoid or something. Yeah. Did he have any, kinda, did he have any other non like uh, other lung nodules outside of the obstructed area? Like, like were they often? I, I mean, all this stuff in the, all the little tree and bud nodules are in the right middle over right. just post obstructive. So, I'm, like I don't. Comas. I don't think so. Huh. No. Very impressive. It, yeah. So I thought that was a very interesting case. So, but um, yeah, I don't know if there's any other clues other than with a car carcinoid, you'd expect it to be enhancing more. But I don't. Still think this would be cancer one, two, three, and four, and five on my differential. But all right. And then this last case is a is a pretty cool one, and um, I don't have to take the blame because all of this well, and there's no blame, but this happened before I got here to UCSF. But this is a guy who was transferred in and was referred here for lung transplant. With he's at this time I think he was 54, yeah. So he was diagnosed back in the early 2000s, like in his early 40s, with what was called severe COPD and stopped smoking at the time and then came here got his work up has had several CTs and this was just called you know textbook paraseptal emphysema severe he actually underwent transplant and um, you know they just called it severe emphysema and the credit I don't have the post lung transplant CT but credit one of my residents when we were reading this out you know she was um, she said well what do you think that is this little thing in the intercostal space and when I first looked at this, I thought it was a striking distribution and pretty impressive. And it, you know, and and then that got me looking at other things, and I noticed this. And the more I looked, the more I saw, because I was getting increasingly suspicious. We've shown a few cases of interstitial of, of of emphysema, and even I wonder if some of these are cysts. If a lot of this is cysts, but you know, findings when it's this striking related to underlying neurofibromatosis. And then sure enough, the more you look, the more I became convinced that these are look like phrenic nerve, probably neurofibromas. And, and um, to make a long story short, they, this patient managed to undergo transplant last year, been worked up for forever, and had, nobody had ever raised the possibility of neurofibromatosis. But it turns out about a month ago, so I read the follow-up study a couple of weeks ago, um, but they had gone to dermatology because they had a, a new skin lesion on their leg. And it was the dermatologist that, that finally, you know, put this all together. And uh, this is part, a portion of his, of his you can see his uh, clamshell sternotomy, but these are all the skin lesions. And so, you know, I guess he managed to kind of, fall through the cracks of not being diagnosed with, with neurofibromatosis even after going undergoing lung transplant. But um, yeah, Howard, and I can't remember who it was, if it was Jeff or Howard, it, or I think I've shown a case that wasn't this severe, but it was a very similar distribution, just striking subpleural you know, uh, paraseptal emphysema. Yeah, so this guy has NF type 1. Were identical to this, maybe not in severity, but the distribution yeah. Appearance of the cysts look exactly like this. It's yeah. Wow. So it's um, yeah, it's it's amazing that he was able to see so many people and have so, so many different you know studies and nobody picked up on the diagnosis. But I think it's why I also tell my residents to be a skeptic. Just don't take things at face value. So we went digging and found it in his chart that they finally diagnosed it. So, Travis, so, do you think if they went back to the explant, they could find some pulmonary neurofibromas? Um, I'm, that's one of my projects to to get the to get them to review. They talk about little foci of atypical adenomatoid hyperplasia, but you know, I don't. I was doing a literature search, seeing if there's if there's any association between the adenomatoid hyperplasia and neurofibromatosis. I couldn't find anything yet, but yes, I, I think that it's worth them taking another look because I think this was just billed as as um, emphysema. Hey, Travis? Yeah. Hey, can I show a companion case? 
Sure. I'm, yeah, this is my last one, so I'm I'm done with this. Here, I'll give it control. <coughs> okay, let me um, let's see which screen I'm sharing here. Okay, let's see. Okay. Okay, so uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Sorry. Let's see. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, so th this patient um, was also billed as a patient with, um, you know, severe emphysema, and you can see that, you know, does have severe emphysema, um, you know, up in the upper lobes. Um, as you come down, you can see some some of these areas have a central dot sign, you know, and so we call this emphysema any day of the week. But then, as you come down, you know, you have more well-defined thin mole cysts here. And certainly, a lot of these are not areas of emphysema. These are thin mole cysts, and um, certainly not as dramatic as, as the last case. But um, a lot of these are, you know, you'd call these thin mole cysts. So, um, and the, look at the uh, soft tissues here. Uh, let's scroll through here. And you can see that, um, you know, there are, of course, all of these uh, neurofibromas of the uh, skin here. So. Um, th this is presumably another case of neurofibromatosis related cystic uh, lung disease with, uh, you know, with, th this was also a smoker, so there's no doubt some smoking related emphysema, but um, some of these are, are, are um, you know, I, I believe are uh, related to neurofibromatosis with, uh, you know, thin mold, well, um, well defined cysts here. Yeah, we buy it, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, it's been my experience. I don't know if what you guys think of. They seem there seems to be a high rate of smoking in these patients. Yeah, I think the ones I've seen so far have had have all had um, pretty significant emphysema too. But um, I do, I just yeah. find most of the ones I've seen are smokers. But the, yeah, you're right. The cysts are very striking. Cool. Anyway, thanks for yeah. All right, um, Howard, I can go. or You can go next. Okay, I can show that too. So, all right, this is the first one. Uh, the context here is the situation that we see not uncommonly, at least here, because we have a bunch of surgeons that do a lot of device implantations. So the clinical situation in part here relates to right ventricular failure com complicating the placement of an LVAD. And there are lots of reasons for that. It's not an uncommon thing, but it's a really problematic thing. And I don't profess to understand exactly why that happens sometimes. Sometimes it happens very acutely in the OR, and they have to institute right ventricular support to get the patient out of the operating room, having placed an LVAD. Sometimes it occurs a little bit later. So in that context, here you see this person obviously has an LVAD, and We've seen variations on this theme, so we see this situation where right ventricular assistance involves the placement of these cannulae and a pump, so extracorporeal, usually the pump is a centrimag pump, but extracorporeal via these cannulae, right ventricular assistance. And then the one that we've shown also is this one, which is the impeller device, but a right-sided impeller device. So let me now put up um, this image, and you can see at this point in time, we do have a right ventricular impeller device, as you see there. But this one I saw the other day for the first time, so this is a new device, which is called a ProTec Duo device. And you can see it's placed via the jugular vein. It has uh, an inflow and an outflow port and let me bring up the image over here on this side so that you can basically take blood out of the right atrium and then pump it beyond the pulmonic valve to relieve the stress on the right ventricle. And you can also put in an inline oxygenator as well. So this is a ProTech device, and I don't know, I think it was approved relatively recently, but this is what it looks like. So it looks like sort of a cannula in a cannula, and right atrium here, 
and then the other one goes just past the pulmonic valve. So I thought I would just share this new device that that I saw for the first time the other day. So Howard, it's funny. And I don't know the merits of them. We we had a patient who had one of those put in two days ago for the exact same reason. They were in the OR. They put in a HeartMate 2 LVAD, and they couldn't get the patient off bypass because the right heart was not behaving itself. And I, I hadn't seen okay. these before, so it's exactly what you showed. But it's in, you're right, because they're yeah. fairly new. Yep. I think they were recently approved, at least in the U.S., I think. Yeah. So just another device to know the name of so that one can report that. All right. This case um, is also very interesting. So. This is what the person's radiograph would look like. This was um, from a little bit after the CT, which I'll show you in a moment. In a moment, I'll withhold some history, but I'll tell you that the patient doesn't present with an acute febrile illness. So we have very extensive poorly marginated and confluent opacities in the lungs. Everything else otherwise looks all right. And these opacities look like this on CT. So I'll scroll through that and mag it up a bit. So up here we do see some emphysema and there is a smoking history which I'll show you in a moment. The patient did quit in 2011 but did smoke heavily before that. And then you'll see as we scroll down what those opacities look like. Easy to see, a bit hard to describe, except that it's very extensive and very abnormal. I'll just go to the soft tissue window just to show you what it looks like. Vessels coursed between them, apparently through them, and so on. And I will say my first reaction was this may be a diffuse adenocarcinoma of lung. There's a little bit of pleural fluid as well. And I didn't really consider anything else in the context at the time, but really worried about tumor. And um, I don't know if anyone else thinks that any other particular diagnosis should come to mind. Oh, that would have been my first guess, but does she have a connective tissue disease? She does not have a connective tissue hmm. disease as such. Because the other thing, we've seen a few cases of, of LIP that have gone kind of crazy with consolidation, and some of those look like little cysts. but. Yeah, I think down here you're absolutely right, and we'll get to that in a moment, but there seem to be other cystic spaces here. Let me just bring that up, which I really didn't really pay that much attention to, but there are some, which you agree, some circumscribed cystic spaces here that are more rounded, just in here, for example. Maybe yeah. some small nodules adjacent to yeah. them. So that's a, that's a good thought, and you've got it. That's exactly what it is. So they did a transbronchial biopsy, and they found amyloid. So there is a history of lymphoma, but that was a long time ago. And let me just see if I can click down there. And here you will see the bronchoscopy report that showed the amyloid. What followed that in part was the measurement of serum and urinary light chains, and they were markedly elevated. And indeed, as you might imagine, they did find some findings suggestive of a clonal population of plasma cells on the bone marrow biopsy. And they also did a endomyocardial biopsy subsequently with no evidence of amyloid. So I really didn't think about that. Uh, maybe I would have if there were a lot of calcifications associated with it, but that really didn't come to mind when I read that one, so I was kind of surprised. Mm -hmm by that, but this is probably the most dramatic one I've seen without calcifications that looks like this. I was very impressed wow. by that. That is very impressive. I, I think it's like the uh, endobronchial cryptococcus case, though. I don't think there's any reason to think about anything other than cancer, at least at yeah. first. Yeah, now that I know there's light chains around, I like to think that some of these cystic spaces down here and some of the nodules are, of course, related to, to the protein but very dramatic case of, of amyloid. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, um, if I have time, I'll show one more. It's okay. not that interesting, so but I'll let you take over now. All right, I've got some cases, and um, 
you'll have to, I may, I can't remember actually if I've shown some of these. So um, this one, I know I haven't. So let me just load it up and change the, what we're showing here. All right, so you should see a contrast enhanced CT scan. Everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so this was an incidental finding. Um, on this patient um, that one of my uh, colleagues ran into, Daniela. Um, so I, I think this was a PE study, but what, what she noticed is if you look at the right pulmonary artery, we see there's a main pulmonary artery, there's an upper lobe pulmonary artery, but the interlobar just stops right here. And you see some bronchial arteries. We have an inferior vein and you see just really no perfusion down here. The right lung is small. And if we look at the lung windows, we can see you know, this nodularity along the pleural surface, some cysts in that lower lobe, and sort of abnormal looking lung, like we've seen in developmentally, developmentally abnormal lungs. And we have pretty juicy intercostal arteries on the right. So I think these little irregularities are transpleural collaterals. And I'm gonna show a companion case to go with that. But this, you notice the cystic stuff is confined really to that lower lobe. The upper lobe has, has of course, has patent vessels and looks developmentally normal. So I've never, we've never seen this before, but it's a sort of a variant of a proximal interruption. It's instead of being the whole pulmonary, it's just the interlobar. Uh, you know, the differential, of course, that we entertain, could this be a fibrosing mediastinitis? But there's no mass here, and the pulmonary veins are wide open, which would not fit with fibrosing mediastinitis at that level. So I don't know, anyone, has any of you ever, ever seen a more distal, you know, atresia, for lack of a better word? No, not that I recall. Yeah, That's very interesting. bizarre. But it's neat because you can contrast the upper lobe from the lower lobe with its sort of abnormalities. But, you know, we see that abnormal, you know, it almost looks like bronchopulmonary dysplasia where you get the this and weird looking stuff and you see there's mosaic attenuation. But I, I really think all these little bumps are transpleural collaterals probably trying to get along the interlobular septa. No, no suspicion of thromboembolic disease causing this? No, none. And if you look, it's just too, it's just too clean. If you look at it, I mean, it just comes to a point. And just, where did it go? Go the other way. You just follow it down and it just smoothly tapers to nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I've got a couple companion cases. So let me show you this case, more traditional case. So this is a, uh, 48 year old patient who was referred here, I think for dyspnea. I'm gonna change the window here. So this is an older CT because it had contrast in it, but you can see lots of bronchial arteries. And then we have this dense soft tissue in the mediastinum with some calcium in it, big main pulmonary artery. And then we see stenosis of the interlobar, but notice it is patent, it's just irregular. The inferior vein has decreased flow in it on the right compared to the left. And the superior vein on the right is occluded. And you see some narrowing of the airways as well, not as, not as bad. So, and then in the lung, we see some pleural fusion thickening, rounded out electasis, but very small vessels. So this is a case of fibrosing mediastinitis. And this is a pretty typical case where you see this, this central fibrosing mass uh, with the calcium in it. And this is almost always histoplasmosis, especially in the US. Um, you know, even though it involves the left lung, you can see most of the, the it, it's taken out the right hilum. And the fusion is presumably because of the venous and lymphatic obstruction. You see a lot of collaterals in the mediastinum. So this is fib this is pretty straightforward fibrosing mediastinitis. So that contrasts to our last case. Now, and then I've got another case of what we call here, at least, because I don't, I don't always see the term used, is a fibrosing hyalitis, which is the same process. I can't remember if I showed you guys this case or not. I may have, but it fit for those of you who may not have seen it. So this patient also has pleural fusion, and you see all these large bronchial arteries and a lot of collaterals along the chest wall. And if we come down to the sort of inferior left hilum, you'll see the same thing that that left lower lobe pulmonary artery tapers, but you have the soft tissue around it with calcification which the other case I showed you did not. There's also narrowing of the vein and narrowing of the airways. And that's how we, uh, on a, it was on a um, non-con study that we first really got suspicious because we noticed the airways were abnormal. And then you see the septal lines, the thickening around them from the obstruction um, of the veins and lymphatics. So that's why this patient has an infusion. But they, you know, they also have subcarinal lymph node enlargement. We see right hyalur lymphadenopathy. Um, 
but this is very different. You've got this calcified mass. So this is a variant of fibrosing mediastinitis, but it's just at the hilar level. And of course, with histoplasmosis, we see the hilar lymph nodes more frequently than mediastinal because it stops here and doesn't make its way up. So you may or may not have seen that before. And then, um, let's see. Oh, and I had one other finding I did want to show on it. Let me get back here. There was another neat finding that I did not show you, and that is down here inferiorly. Right here, you see this blush of contrast. And there's actually, this is actually a transpleural collateral. Um, I didn't, I must not have grabbed the right images, but I had one image that showed a better connection, but this is coming off this intercostal into the right lung. So we talked about these transpleural collaterals, but this was a large tuft of, of artery, uh, probably all coiled up in here that actually crossed the pleural space. And we saw it because of the effusion. So all these collateral pathways, you see just how big the intercostals are on the left compared to the right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and then one more vascular case here. Um, let's pull this one up. This is a, I forget how old. This was another incidental finding. And this is, uh, we've just been, this came to mind. I, I may have shown you guys this years ago. Um, I don't remember the case, but uh, I was asked to take a look at this because we were following this. But um, this patient had had an incidental finding of these large bronchial arteries and actually a bronchial artery aneurysm we see coming off just around the aorta with these large bronchial arteries. No explanation for them. We see dilated bronchial arteries on both sides. Um, but I've never seen an aneurysm that I could recall of a bronchial artery. Have any of you? Um, I showed one case of bronchial artery aneurysm in a patient with thyroid, metastatic thyroid cancer, but yeah, I don't remember. We were not sure exactly why they had developed. Well, well, yeah, so here it is coming off the aorta on the coronal, and I, and they're big beyond it, so I think it's whatever's causing bronchial arterial hypertrophy led to this. But um, yeah, so we had the reason I came across it, I was, we were just, uh, I was asked to see if it had changed or anything because I think they were going to quit following it because it had been pretty stable. And I don't know what you do about them other than I guess you could, because it, I mean, it's kind of a fusiform aneurysm. I mean, I guess you could embolize it, but if it's not doing anything, probably not. So that's that. Yeah, I remember Charlie, uh, Charlie Sayer from London showed a case, I think, at the conference once of a patient um, with idiopathic bronchial artery aneurysms and bleeding and really sick from bleeding, and they could never figure out why she had such such uh, extensive aneurysms of the bronchial arteries, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm surprised we don't see them more often, to be honest, like with people with bronchiectasis or something. So this is a nice case. This is just a fun case. This is a patient with connective tissue disease, and you can see there's the lungs are, you know, the volumes are small. There may be some Maybe something in the basis, but not terribly excited about it. Probably just underinflated. But you can see this fine sort of dense reticular, for lack of a better descriptor, in the soft tissues along the chest wall. I'll show you the CT. Uh, and you can guess what connective tissue disease probably was. But just exuberant calcification. And it's primarily along the muscular surfaces. You can see a little bit in the fat, but a lot of it's in the muscle or along the muscle. So this patient had dermatomyositis and did have a, um, a little bit of uh, stuff in the lung bases. I'm kind of underwhelmed. I think most of it's just dependent stuff, dependent opacities. Um, but I thought this was too, this was from a pelvis CT. I thought this image was just really nice, just exuberant calcinosis. So, And it's subcutaneous, isn't it, primarily in the fat, I guess? Yeah, in this case, it's subcutaneous. And the chest CT, it's sitting right on the muscles, but I wonder if it's like right along the cert. I don't know why it's doing Let's see. Grab the bar. But yeah, you see it, you see it on the anterior chest wall, just under the skin. A lot of soft tissue edema in the body wall. And then maybe right along the surface of the muscle. So maybe just abutting it along the uh you know, where I forget yeah. all the, the, the fascia around it. And then um let's see, where's this is kind of a neat case. So this is a patient who uh got a CT scan, came in with uh some vague symptoms. Hold on, I'll make it show you the right one. There we go. So you see on the radiograph, small lung volumes and then these sort of ill-defined nodules in the lungs. So you might think infection, metastases, aspiration. And the CT scan is quite striking. You see these not ground glass nodules or 
heart solid nodules with halos around them. Some of them are quite large. Oh, um, yeah. And then some better well defined nodules. So basal predominant, look hematogenous. So we might think of like angiosarcoma, choriocarcinoma. Um, but I, you know, I've seen this pattern as well with uh, uh, mucinous tumors, but also yeah, and so and also pancreatic tumors. Pancreatic as well, yeah. Yeah. So this ended up being pancreatic carcinoma, but with these just wow. really, really pretty halos. So you know, Jeff, I'm glad you brought this up. We've had a couple of recent cases yeah. of pancreatic adenocarcinoma looking like this, and. One of them, well, two of them that we biopsied, doing CT guided biopsy, both of them had hemoptysis. So for some reason, they were very, um, they were very vascular, like you would expect with angiosarcoma. Yeah. And this one's kind of interesting. If you look here, it almost looks like it's confined by lobular anatomy, and you can see some arch architecture, like a little crazy paving. So I don't, I don't know what's happening here, if there's localized lipidic growth. If it's mucin production, um, you know, these are usually just run of the mill pancreatic adenocarcinomas, or what? I, I, I really can't explain them. I'd have to, you almost have to wedge one of these out and look at, see what's going on with one of them. But yeah, this was just a striking case of this. So I don't can't remember if we, I think we saw something in the belly that made us think this was going to be pancreas. Oh, yes, there were vague liver metastases. So this was an, an outside CT that one of my colleagues looked at, but we saw these vague opacities. In the liver think and i think there's something maybe here in the pancreas but they biopsy the liver and got adenocarcinoma in the pancreas okay well that's all i have howard you said you had one more okay i can show this one uh one this one is is uh, mostly just to show a nice example mostly for um, residents of an artifact that will simulate aortic injury so of course this is a big time trauma lots and lots of findings but what I want to show is uh, the CT. So scrolling through this, let me just make it a little bit bigger. And getting down to not the usual place for aortic injury, the isthmus, but a little bit further down, round about here, the person began to question abnormality involving the aorta. So let me just scroll all the way down and you can see that it looks a little bit odd. But I think if you look at the entirety of this and you scroll back and forth, you can reasonably work out that this is likely a combination of artifact from mediastinal emphysema, pneumomediastinum, with some street artifact. And then I think a part of it, I think, has to do with cardiac pulsation. So I wonder if the person was tachycardic, but you can see the heart beating here. And perhaps, at least for a portion anteriorly, this also is related to an artifact from cardiac pulsation. So, of course, in this dimension, the candy cane view, you can see that the apparent dissection is really confined to just this anterior portion of the aorta, not at all typical by virtue of its location, its appearance, its length for an acute injury. And certainly, if it was, it would probably be a type 1 injury, an intimal injury. But we talked about this and strongly suggested that this was an artifact, that they don't put a stent in right off, and we indeed just repeated the exam. Um, so this is the repeat exam, and of course we did this one with prospective ECG triggering. I'm not saying that made the difference, but you can see here um, we don't have any artifact, so there's no question here that the aorta is just fine in that location. So just an example of a potential pitfall a potential concern for aortic injury that can come about uh, because of artifacts related to pulsation and air, I believe. Anyone else have any comments about that? Do you agree that it's probably from those two origins, the artifact? Yeah, Howard, I, I like your theory. And also, if you go back to the candy cane view, it almost looks like there's ghosting of the posterior wall of the left ventricle, or the, the that ventricle there, I'm sorry, on the aorta, like it's double mapped. Mm -hmm. That's a double or something. It does look kind yeah. of odd, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I've never seen it. With a ventricle, it's just like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, like I'm, I'm glad you showed this case because I've never seen that artif a pulsation oh, artifact yeah. there. <clears throat> That's a really good case. Yeah. So just a nice teaching case um, of that. And 
and the patient's obviously got other issues and doesn't need a stent uh, <laughs> for an, a non-injury. Uh, yeah. All righty, that's my third case, Jeff. All right, Travis, you said you had a few more? Sure. All right, here's one. You guys see this CT? Yes. Yep. Okay, so this is um, a woman who, as you can see, has an endovascular stent. She had probably what was just a, a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer of her proximal descending thoracic aorta that was stented back in 2013. And she came back in this past week. She had been admitted somewhere else for a few months of worsening dyspnea. She also had um, bacteremia. It was, I think, E. coli bacteremia for a, a couple of months and had been placed on long-term antibiotics. And for some reason, I don't know if she had chest pain or whatever, got this CT at an outside hospital. And now you can see that she has gas around her aorta. She's got a wall thickening here too and it's in the vicinity of the esophagus. And this was done at the outside hospital. Now they they also did this study where they gave her oral contrast and this is where it's kind of interesting because you'll see the oral contrast. You can see a direct track now encircling the stent and along the aorta. So the when she got transferred here obviously we said this is probably, or this is, looks like an aortoesophageal fistula. And um, I guess, I don't know, because she's not a surgical candidate, I don't know, they just felt like they had to image her more or get contrast to just confirm. But you can see, you can still see even on this that you've got the gas. So uh, she's not a surgical candidate. I guess there's no communication or frank communication just because she has this covered stent here. Uh, but she has been anemic, and there's some question of whether or not she's been losing blood into her esophagus. But because of comorbidities, she was just sent home on antibiotic uh, therapy. But I thought this was a, a pretty good example, especially the the um, the, the oral contrast here. Did any of that contrast go into the lumen of the A water, or is it just around? It was just. It was just around it. So clearly, clearly yeah. there's infection involving the wall of the aorta. And so, yeah, I yes. guess it's, I don't know if you can call it a fistula yet, or at least not a, a frank fistula. But if, if it does end up with a hole in the graft, then she will uh, probably not, be... not survive very long after that. Um, but, yeah, just obviously whenever you have a history of bacteremia, always interrogate stents or you know, try and find an explanation and any foreign body would be a good explanation. So that one. Um, there's one, I was going to pull up this case just with, with Howard's case. This is a 31-year-old and this is an old case but I pulled it up for a talk and they have a history of, of some sort of IgA deficiency and had dyspnea and have this CT. And if, if you look at the CT, most of it's just bilateral, somewhat peripheral and perilobular areas of consolidation. It's relatively symmetric. Uh, she underwent biopsy, and we'll get to that in a second. She's un also got some underlying architectural distortion of fibrosis. I think when I looked at this first, just going back through old cases, I would have guessed maybe an organizing pneumonia. Um, there was certainly some question of, of whether she really had IgA deficiency or if she could have common variable immune deficiency and certainly GLILD was on the differential as well. But when they um, when they biopsied this, and this gets back to the kind of what I was saying with Howard, that this was all LIP, at least according to what they got on uh, on biopsy. So I thought this was an interesting pattern. And we see a lot of times with consolidation that ends up getting biopsied in, in interstitial lung disease that patients have have some component of, of LIP. And I know that the differential or the diagnosis of LIP is, you know, maybe a little controversial too, and maybe it's just our pathologist calling it that. But yeah, I just thought that this was an interesting, interesting pattern just with consolidation. So I don't know if some of this could be proteins that are produced by the, by the lymphocytes that are in here as well. But um, I just thought that was interesting. I don't know, Jeff or Howard or, or Brand, if you guys have seen similar cases like this. It kind of and this patient did not have or did, uh, hypogammaglobulinemia. 
what was the question? Does she have that or? Yeah. Uh, or no, just yeah, just IGA deficiency is what they said. So. Yeah, they the um yeah, and they, it actually brought up that question of hypogammaglobulinemia or CBID, yeah. uh, but there was nothing besides this IgA. So I don't think I've ever seen a case of what could be a GLILD with perhaps florid LIP in the context of an immunodeficiency disorder other than CVID. Right. Yeah, because he, I think he even had a little bit of lymphadenopathy. I mean, just small nodes, which sometimes we see with CV with with GLILD as well. But I don't know. Was the spleen a weird case? The spleen, because you usually see that with GLILD. Oh yeah, it's a bit big. Ooh. Huge spleen. Yeah. So goes along with an immuno proliferation disorder or you know lymphoproliferation disorder. maybe they should maybe they should check that diagnosis of the IGA one yeah. <laughs> who knows it looks maybe they out. should be cons all right well jeff that's my last one i got to right. take care of a case Great. here so no, no problem i think thanks everybody um, all right. we'll uh, see you next week yeah. great cases thank you bye, -bye. bye.